It all starts with a man named Henry Morton Stanley, a Welsh, American journalist and explorer. Our find here was a key instrument in establishing the Belgian Empire in the Congo, as well as the Belgian King Leopold II's exploitation of the region for profit. Stanley saw great opportunities in the Congo for profit and enticed Leopold II with the prospect of abundant resources. Leopold II employed Stanley and he was paid what would now be $250,000 per year in today's money. He was paid this much to establish trading stations, secure the sovereignty of the territory, and deal with local chiefs to gain access to the resources promised. So all this means is that he drafted contracts and passed them off as peace treaties and he managed to convince local chieftains who trusted him that their signatures only meant they would now be considered friends of the Belgian king. Keep in mind that some of these chiefs had never even seen written word before yet they put an X on the dotted line anyway, Leopold II's interest in the Congo represented Belgium's position in the world as a relatively new state with a weak, fragmented bourgeoisie that lacked confidence in itself and its projects. Leopold II exploited the Congo for super profits through huge concessions to Belgian companies and treaties with Congolese chiefs, which were often obtained under false pretenses. So while other European powers had colonies across the continent of Africa as extensions of their own nations after the now infamous Berlin Conference of 1884, Congo was the personal property of King Leopold II. Although he was later forced to release the Congo from under his iron fist in 1908, the damage had already been done and the road paved for his kinsmen to follow suit. The brutal colonization of the Congo by Belgium had immense impact on the region and its people, particularly the Batatela people a tribe that Patrice Lumumba came from. Also, the establishment of missions by Catholic and Methodist missionaries from Europe and America played a significant role in the administration of the colony, collecting taxes and punishing those who didn't comply. Later native authorities were established, these were rural leaders that were chosen by the Belgian authorities and these so-called leaders would act as gatekeepers to even more land and resources for their masters. They were also the only ones allowed to make contact with the Belgian higher-ups. So in short this ensured access to land and proscribed specific identities for indigenous ethnic groups. This was also the introduction of racism because non-Africans now had a complete separate system to follow and place to live. The Africans had to address all their issues with the native authorities. Lumumba had highly condemned the practices of brutal punishment of rubber tappers, which continued until the 1950s. Some accounts say he himself witnessed such inhumane treatment of his fellow Congolese during his upbringing. In the early 1950s Lumumba worked for a brewery where he was the highest ranking Congolese employee and his salary was descent given the plight of African workers in Belgian Congo. He would frequent many bars to promote Polar, the beer of the brewery he worked at, but these bars were ironically also the place where the Congolese people would share their thoughts about the political situation in the country. The 1950s saw a huge boost in the economy of Congo due to the copper production and this meant that the new European upper class lived in more luxury and all the more reason for the Belgian government to hold on to this African giant at all cost. Before long Lumumba made contact with the most important movers and shakers in the world of Leopoldville's politics today known as the capital Kinshasa. He met people who he had known before only by reputation. Many of these people were going to be caught up in the maelstrom of events leading up to independence. This included two important Josephs, Ilio and Mobutu. The former, Ilio, became one of the founders of the Movement National Congolese MNC, that would help lead the struggle to independence, he was also an important member of the Evelu community in the capital. Lumumba immediately forced himself onto the political scene of the capital. Michel Junga, a friend of Lumumba at the time recalled his sharp intelligence, he read. A newspaper in a flash. He was informed on everything. Lumumba was elected president of the MNC on October 10, 1958, a party that sought a national reach and was going to become the instrument in which he would be elected prime minister in June 1960. When the MNC was formed it pledged to fight against all forms of separatism and to obtain, within a reasonable, time and through negotiation, independence. 
Many of the main players of Congolese nationalism signed the declaration, Cyril Adullah, Joseph Ilio, and Patrice Lumumba. Cyril Adullah had an interesting past, he was one of a few Congolese who had been able to complete his secondary education. He worked as a bank clerk and had recently helped to organize the first Congolese trade unions. Lumumba was elected president, Adola and Gaston Diomi vice presidents. But one notable absence was the signature of Joseph Kassa Vubu. He had refused to sign the petition in August and regarded the founding document of the MNC as far too moderate. His organization Abaco issued their own call for immediate independence one week after the foundation of the MNC, advocating the nationalization of large companies. Kassa Vubu, now middle-aged, had been a seminary student, and he shifted between forms of regionalist and national organization. Sometimes he made radical statements calling for immediate independence, but frequently he appeared as a champion of regional identities. So for example in the 1940s, he had argued that the future ownership of the country should be in the hands of the Bakongo, those he regarded as descendants of the pre-colonial Congo Empire, rather than the nation as a whole. For years Abako was seen much more narrowly as an organization simply for the promotion of linguistic identity and a glorified social club. Lumumba's election to president of the new organization was a surprise to many. Although he was by far the most impressive member of the Congolese elite, he was relatively new to the city. By the end of October he was also elected to the leadership of the Batatela organization. This meant that his only solid constituency was among the relatively small community of the Batatela in Leopoldville. But despite his relative obscurity Lumumba succeeded in imposing his character and vision on the MNC. When it came to the question of whether independence should be immediate, there were some important divisions. Kasa Vubu's call for independence, and his demand for nationalization, was regarded by many of the ethnic affiliates of the MNC as far too radical. Lumumba did not necessarily share these reservations, but he did see the importance of holding the organization and its potentially divisive membership together. If this meant that occasionally he had to hold his tongue, then so be it. Lumumba was consumed more than ever by political activity and had no time to sell beer. At the beginning of 1959 he resigned from his position at the brewery. Although only 18 months away from independence it is interesting to note that Lumumba was unique among the founding members of the MNC to do this. The others pursued their careers, making time in the evening and weekends for political mobilization. Politics had been a hobby of the educated class, many wanted it to remain so. Perhaps Lumumba saw further than the others, Jacques Nins, who knew Lumumba, argued that he lived only for political ideas, for the country and for the achievement of independence of the Congo. Congolese independence was declared on June 30, 1960, and celebrations across the country lasted for days. The Independence Day ceremony was held in the presence of King Baudouin of Belgium who patronizingly sought to grant the Congo freedom in the name of the Belgian state. The day did not turn out as anyone predicted. Officially the event was due to take place in the parliament building in front of the Belgian elite, newly elected members of the Congolese parliament and foreign dignitaries and reporters. Like many such ceremonies at the time, it was seen simply as the official announcement of a negotiated independence, involving speeches, handshakes, and the lowering and raising of flags. The Guardian reported on July 1, the crowd around the wide square of the Palais de Nations was as small, and as unenthusiastic as an independence crowd could be. There were only about 4,000 there, due, perhaps, to the confusion caused by hasty arrangements. But the shouts of Le Roy from loyal Belgians as the king entered the parliament building was the first cheering note. For him. Lumumba had not been scheduled to speak, and the government was to be represented by its president, Joseph Kassa Vubu. The king rose to announce the official end of Belgian rule in the Congo, but he did much more. His speech turned into a historical justification for the crimes of colonization, he argued that the last 80 years had seen development and the fulfilling of the white man's burden. Lumumba finally finished the speech, to loud and long applause, and returned to his chair. The program was interrupted for an hour as the king threatened to leave. The king, 
as the personification of Belgian power, had correctly taken the speech as a personal insult. This was an insult that the Belgian establishment would never forgive. The Belgian press called for revenge. Never had the dignity of the Belgian state been so insulted. Patrice Lumumba was the first prime minister of independent Congo. Though Lumumba and Kasa Vubu had worked together presenting a united voice of condemnation against the secession of Katanga and Kasai, by September 1960 they broke. September 5 Kasa Vubu took the first step and attempted to remove Lumumba and appoint a new government. Lumumba rushed to parliament for support, it backed the prime minister, maintaining that the president had acted illegally. The political impasse was the opportunity that Mobutu and his Western backers were looking for. On September 14, Mobutu took control in a bloodless coup, effectively removing Kasa Vubu and Lumumba. This peaceful revolution, as Mobutu described it, was targeted at civilian politicians who would now be given a cooling off period. Life in Leopoldville began to reflect the collapse of political hope. According to Lumumba, the capital of the republic is a scene of disorder, where a handful of hired military men are ceaselessly violating law and order. The citizens of Leopoldville now live under a reign of terror. As the Congo fragmented before his eyes, Lumumba's family was faced with its own tragedy. Early in November Pauline gave birth prematurely to their fourth child, a girl called Marie-Christine. Medical aid was given too late and his daughter died. Lumumba who was now stripped of his political power pleaded with the UN to let him bury his daughter in his hometown, his request was denied. Lumumba was now under house arrest and an attempt to escape Stanleyville later failed. Soldiers in a nearby town caught up with him. The party was rounded up and taken to Muika, the regional town. There was a Ghanaian contingent of the UN stationed in the town, and Lumumba immediately appealed for their intervention to prevent his removal to Leopoldville. This was denied, they had not received orders to protect him. Lumumba was then flown to Leopoldville. Again the UN refused to intervene. Brigadier Indarjit Ricky, the head of the UN military mission, saw him cut and bleeding, glasses broken, but we could not intervene, said Ricky. They also had no authority. Lumumba was beaten in front of TV cameras. Finally death came. On January 17 Lumumba was flown to Elizabethville with two fellow prisoners Maurice Mpolo and Joseph Okito. Already beaten and tortured he was dragged by Katangan forces commanded by a Belgian, to Villa Brova. Here he was tortured again, as Chambe decided how to kill him. Later in the evening they were thrown into a military vehicle and driven to a nearby wood. A Belgian officer assembled and commanded three firing squads, while another Belgian organized the execution site. Patrice Lumumba and his two comrades, Mpolo and Okito, were shot one after the other. Chambe was present. Then Gerard Sot, a Belgian police officer, unearthed the bodies from their shallow grave, chopped each body into pieces and then dissolved them with canisters of acid. When there was no more acid remaining the body parts were burnt. The murders were officially announced on February 13, 1961, seven and a half months after independence. Lumumba was only 36 years old. The hope for a democratic and independent Congo was, for the time being, extinguished, and foreign interests could rule again. The day after the announcement of Lumumba's murder the Indonesian poet Sabar Santoso Anantaguna wrote. The news came early in the morning. Lumumba is dead. Lumumba is dead. Anger split the whole world asunder. A worker shouts, who can murder my age, the rails of the trains the length of the light of the sun we are all Lumumba. Lumumba. Freedom that's Lumumba. Lumumba. The news came early in the morning. Lumumba is dead. Lumumba is dead the earth shook the revolution marches on. Long live Lumumba. Who was responsible for Lumumba's downfall? 
Although the act of Lumumba's murder was carried out by Belgian and Katangan forces, an unholy alliance of Western interests lay behind his demise. We can name some of the guilty parties, Belgium, the United Kingdom and the United States. British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan had joined in the fray, calling Lumumba a communist stooge. Western powers had used the threat of Soviet intervention to justify their action against Lumumba, they sought to prevent the mineral-rich Congo falling into the hands of the communists. The UN also played an important part in Lumumba's fall. The organization was not immune from the imperial objectives of some of its powerful member states, nor was it simply an empty vessel to be filled by the unequal weight of its affiliates. The international organization was an important actor in the events that were unfolding in the Congo. I hope you have enjoyed this mini-documentary by Keiko Films. Spreading knowledge one video at a time. Goodbye.